You know, I, I've got to say it. I don't know if you're grumpy because of mass, but I never heard a single amen for all the work of the choir and leading us in worship today. I mean, let's thank the Lord. What a wonderful day to be together, and I kept waiting, and I kept waiting, and I kept waiting, so we'll just say it together. Let's say amen. Amen. So be it. We're grateful that you're here today, and we're beginning a new series, All Things New, All Things New. Now, I don't know about you, but I, I am a, a nut for the Olympics. I, I enjoy the Olympics. When that flame went out last week, I was a little down. Our TV wasn't turned to anything but the Olympics while I was home, and we loved it. If it was on, I would watch it. Sports, I would never watch it any other season. I'll watch during the Olympics. I mean, I, I don't watch ribbons generally. Stephen, I think, does, and he has a little rhythm he could do for us, but I would watch that if it was on in prime time. I enjoy it. And there was one night that there was ladies diving going on. You may have seen this. There was a 14-year-old Chinese diver. She was remarkable. Her scores were near perfection as her dives kept creasing into the pool with nary a splash. And all of a sudden, the nines and the nine fives became 10 and 10 and 10. And you could hear the announcers as they were becoming more excited because they knew she was headed to a new Olympic record for her scores, and she accomplished that. It was the thrill of victory. But there was another diver, another female, a champion in her own right. She was an Olympian. How many of us can say that? An Olympian. And yet, as she made her way down the platform, she realized something was off, and rather than risk injury, when she came off that platform, did you see it? What did she do? She put her arms down, and she did a perfect pencil dive. In fact, if they were judging the pencil dive, it was a 10. They weren't judging the pencil dive, and the scores came up. Zero, 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 zero. You know, that's a metaphor for how many of us live our lives. When things are great and when things are all 10s, we feel good. Our sense of self and satisfaction is great. We are we're on top of the world, but when things are not going our way, when things become difficult, when the promotion doesn't come through, when, when things in the family aren't right, when COVID is threatening us once again, what do we do? We get down in the dumps. We're down. And that is not the life that God has for us. He doesn't intend for us to bounce around like a beach ball in the ocean as it goes from wave to wave to wave. There's a better way and we're going to be talking about this in this new series as we go through the book of Philippians. I was so excited when the pastor announced this. I've wanted this series for years. And we're going to be diving deep in worship each and every week. You need to be here. If you're online with us today, we are so grateful that you're here. We want you to be with us. We want you to be a part of what God's doing here. And in the book of Philippians, one of the reasons we love it so much is because Paul talks about joy. Now, I don't know about you, I need some joy in my life. And Paul talks about how God doing his work within us, this new work, brings about joy. We're not being bounced around. We're not on this plane of happiness where it depends upon what we do, how we achieve, how we feel, but it's about a deep inner conviction that God himself, through Jesus Christ to us, has brought us to a new place, and there is joy in that. We're going to be looking at it. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Philippians chapter 1. As we begin this service, our series, we're going to begin in verse 1, and we'll go through verse 11. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God in all of my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you, all making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. It is right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart. For you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, and how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. 
And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may be blameless, so that you may be blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. So let's talk about this church, this church that Paul expresses his great love and gratitude The church at Philippi was founded in about 51 AD. It was a part of Paul's second missionary journey. If you're familiar with those journeys, on the second journey, he experiences this vision, this Macedonian call to take the gospel to Europe. And so Paul makes that trip, he crosses the water, and he comes to the first city, that's Philippi. Now, Philippi is an old city at this point. It was a Greek city. It's now a Roman city, a Roman colony. It has very special distinction with the empire. The citizens there are called Roman citizens. Very proud of that. You remember Paul was proud of his Roman citizenship. In fact, it serves him in Philippi. This is a city of commerce, much like Dallas. It was at a center of a, of a major highway, a road that connected the Adriatic and the Aegean seas. People were coming in and they were going out. There was a military garrison there. There was a medical school there. It was a very cosmopolitan city, the type of city that Paul would want to plant a church in because he knew the gospel would be spread for those who came and those who left. If you want to know more about the Philippian church, go to Acts chapter 16. You'll find out about the founding of this church and what God did, who the people were. I'd encourage you, after church, go look at that. But what you're going to see in Scripture all across this series is there's an underlying theme of joy, of joy. And what I want us to understand today is that joy celebrates. Now, what's interesting about this is Paul didn't have a lot personally to celebrate as he wrote this letter. It's about 10 years since he had first made his way into uh, Philippi, but now he's in Rome. Now, Paul's always wanted to be in Rome, but not in the way that he is. He's under arrest. He's under house arrest, and yet he takes the opportunity to continue to meet with people, to share the gospel, to write letters to the churches, to help them understand just the richness and the fullness of the grace of our Lord. So that's the beginning of the Philippian church. So if you're taking notes, and I hope you always do, we're going to be talking about in this celebration of joy three points, and the first one is this. In joy, there's a celebration of grace. A celebration of grace. Look in verse 2. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this is a common salutation for Paul to use. He used it in all of his letters to the churches. In every one of those epistles, you see grace and peace to you. And because of that, we might be tempted just to move on beyond it. But there's some theology here. There's some teaching just in this common expression, grace and peace to you. Paul loves the word grace. You can't read his letters without, without seeing grace over and over and over again. This unmerited favor that God expresses to you, to me, through Jesus Christ. The richness, the fullness of God's love expressed in Christ's grace. And what he says here is that in grace, there's peace. There's peace. In a few weeks, we'll be in Philippians 4. He's going to talk there about a peace that passes all understanding. Grace and peace to you. You know, it couldn't have been easy for Paul to be locked in that home, to be in chains, to be guarded. And yet he could speak of grace and peace. And for each of us, that grace and peace is available to us this day. You know, these are anxious days. They're anxious days. Again, none of us want to be in the mask again. You can't pick up a paper. You can't watch the news without reading all that's happening in our world. This morning when my alarm went off, I picked up my phone to turn it off, and I had a news story that had been pushed to it overnight, and it said it was a bad week. Well, happy Sunday right there, you know. (laughs) It was a bad week, and the underlying premise was, and the next week's not going to be any better. This is an anxious world, and yet Paul says there's a counter to that. There's grace, and out of that grace, we have the peace of God. But if you're here today and you're not experiencing that peace, if you're online today and you're not experiencing the peace of God, you need to understand there is no peace absent grace. And so we begin this book 
with a celebration of God's grace. The second point, we'll spend some time here, is a celebration of fellowship. A celebration of fellowship. Look with me in verse 3. I thank my God and all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It's right for me to feel this way about you all, because I hold you in my heart, for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and then in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. Now in verse 3, he says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, in all of my remembrance of you. What's he saying there? Well, the word you is all-inclusive. Now, as a Georgia boy, I would translate this this way. I thank my God in all my remembrance of y'all. That's what he's saying. The church. When he thinks of the church at Philippi, he's driven to thanksgiving. You know, I can imagine Paul's face as he's writing these words, as he's speaking them, and they make their way to the paper. I thank my God. And he thinks of Lydia. Go home, read in Acts 16 about Lydia. He thinks about the jailer who was about to take his life. And Paul stops and shares the gospel. Paul has the opportunity to lead him, his wife, his family to faith in Christ. They're baptized. He's thinking of them. And he says, I thank God. Now, for those of you that know me well, you'll you'll identify this with me. I'm not the most demonstrative person. Now, the name Shell is German. I also have a lot of Swiss on my mother's side. Swiss, German, we're not demonstrative. So when I say this, I want you to hear it the way I say it. I love you. I love this church. When I think of Park City's Baptist Church, my heart swells. When I think of Park City's, I do what a lot of you did when you came back off of lockdown. I began to tear up. My first service in here, I was seated right back there in the balcony. And I'll never forget, I had been working in my office day after day for weeks and months. But when that first service, as the organ began to swell, as we stood to sing, all of a sudden I surprised myself and I began to tear up. I'm about to tear up now. I love my church. I love being here. And I know so many of you identify with that. I love our history. I love our heritage. I'm a history geek. I love what God has done over the 82 years of this church. I love our church. I love our future. You know, when I think of COVID, I wouldn't have wanted to be with any other church family in the world than this family. We love our church. I want you right now, if you're in the balcony, I want you to look around. If you're on the main floor, look around. Literally, I want you to look at the people you're at worship with. You're with the family. You're with the family. I hope that gives you great joy. Your heart swells, but this is what I want you to understand. You're with a small part of the family. You're not with the entire family right now. Right now, across this campus, there is we worship and there is kids worship. There's middle school live, there's high school live, there's Great Hall Contemporary Worship. At 12.30, we'll hear the voices in Spanish as they praise the Lord as we have this morning. This is a broad church. There are connect groups meeting this hour just like last hour, just like we were in the chapel in the Great Hall. And for us to say we love Park City's Baptist Church, what we need to understand is we love it all. We love the breadth and the diversity of this church. You can't say you love this church and combine it to one space and one venue and one form. We love our church. Paul's writing to a diverse church. He's writing to a church that's Greek and Roman, Jewish, Gentile, slave, free, male, female. There are people coming in from different nations, and yet he says, I love this church. Love your church. Now, I met some guests earlier today, and I don't know what you think of us, but I'm going to pop your bubble right here. We are not a perfect church. Now, I didn't get an amen there either, but we're not a perfect church. (laughs) We're just like any other group of people, and we'll have issues, and we have things that we work through together, but that does not mean that we don't love the church. The church at Philippi that he's remembering, he doesn't remember a perfect church. In fact, as you go through it, he's correcting All across it, he's correcting them. You get to chapter 4, and he calls names. He calls names. You look at it. Yodius and Tiki, he calls them out. 
Why? Because whatever has happened has put them in odds and people are forming sides. We're not a perfect church. But God calls us to love perfectly as he does, to love one another. We're going to talk more about that. You know, the other night I was driving by the church, and I did as I always do. I slowed down and I looked just to make sure everything looked right and everything was good. And as I drove by the sanctuary, I did as I always do. I look up at the steeple. I love our steeple. And it was lit up. And if you have driven by, you know what I'm talking about. But at the very top of the steeple, just before, and I don't know the architectural term, but it cones up to the cross, around in a circle around the steeple, there's a series of arched windows. And at night, there's a beautiful light that flows out. It gives the image of a lighthouse. And I can remember thinking, this church is a lighthouse to University Park. This church is a lighthouse to Preston Hollow to the city of Dallas, to Lake Highlands, to Highland Park, all across this city, we are a lighthouse. But my friends, the intensity of the light is dependent upon the love that we have, first of all, for our Lord, and secondly, for one another. And if we don't love well, the light of this church is going to be diminished. Love well. And Paul says, embrace one another. Embrace the diversity. Embrace the generations. Love. And he says, I thank my God. And I hope right now in your heart you're saying, I thank my God for my church. Now look with me in verse 4. Because in verse 4, he talks about a natural expression of loving the church. He says this, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy. Making my prayer for you with joy. A natural extension of loving the church is you pray for the church. I read a story this past week. I'd heard it before, but it was perfect for this message. In 1792, the first mission-sending organization of the modern era was constituted. Andrew Fuller was the leader of this group, and they met, and they began to talk about the opportunities for missions work around the world. They heard reports. They had a particularly stirring report about India. Andrew Fuller stood up and he said, India is a gold mine for missions work. Who will go there for us and mine the depths? William Carey was in the room. William Carey quickly replied and said, I'll go down there. But you that remain, you remain to hold the ropes. I love the imagery of that. When we say we love the church, that means that we hold the ropes of the church. Well, what does that mean? Paul tells us. We pray. We pray. And we're not praying bold uh, prayers alone. We're praying the small prayers. I had several of you text me this morning, Rodney, I'm going to pray for you as you get up. My little grandchild is watching today online, and, and they prayed for me this morning. I love those prayers. But we are called to also pray bold prayers. Paul prayed for the Ephesians church, Ephesians chapter 3, that God would do far beyond what they could hope or imagine. That's the way we ought to pray for our church. We hold the ropes when you pray for your pastor. You know, I love history, and I would tell you, when you look, at least in modern history, in the last hundred years or more, there's never been a more difficult time to pastor a church. You need to be praying for Pastor Jeff. You need to be praying for your pastoral staff for your ministers, for those who lead. You need to pray for your deacon leadership, for those that have been called out of the body to offer leadership within church. Pray for them. You know, anybody can sit in a pew and complain. Do you know that? I've probably done it once or twice myself. Anybody can do that. Anybody can critique. Anybody can judge. But God calls us to hold the ropes, to pray, to serve, to give, For this church to be the lighthouse to the city that we're called to be, it calls for all of us to hold the ropes, to hold the ropes, to pray for your connect group leaders, to pray what's happening in the life of this body, but to pray the bold prayers. And look in verse 4, he says to pray with joy. Think about your church, smile and pray, and you ask God, you do it, God. If it's going to happen, God, it'll be by your spirit. And I want you to look in verse 5. In verse 5, he says, because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. What does that mean? It means that together at Park City's Baptist Church, all across the breadth of this church, we are in partnership together across the generations. One of the things I love about this is we're multiple generations that come together into this church. 
I love the fact that there are men and women that have walked with Jesus for decades. Decades and decades. One lady that was in the chapel service this morning that I dearly love came up to me afterwards, and she's about like me. She's not prone to tears. And I think she had a tear in her eye, and she said, Rodney, I I can't tell you what this meant. She said, I love this church. She's been a leader in this church, a history in this church. She said, I love my church. My life has been spent through the ministries of this church, and I am grateful to God for Park Cities. We are in partnership together, and that's what Paul is saying here to the Philippians church. They are in partnership with him. What? In the work that God has for them. Look in verse 6. In verse 6, he says, and I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. He speaks here of confidence. I'm sure, I'm confident, depending on the translation that you have. What we need to understand is that Paul's life wasn't easy, but he was confident in what God was doing. God had always been faithful, despite all the challenges, the beatings, the shipwrecks, God was faithful. And the language that he uses here speaks of God working in his life and in our lives to bring about a result according to his good plan. Now think about that. God has a good plan for you. Not just for the preacher, not just for Stephen, not just for me. God has a good plan for you. And Paul says he's confident. He's confident that God is going to accomplish this. But I want you to understand this. The question isn't whether God is going to do his work. It's whether I'm going to do my work. It's whether I'm going to do my work. You know, before COVID, we would go out to dinner a lot. We're empty nesters. And and it always struck me that you would go into a restaurant and you would see a family come in. And you know what they would do? Think about it. Everybody would reach in their pocket and pull out what? Phone. Yeah, the kids weren't pulling out money. They were pulling out their phone. And I would watch, and my wife one time chastised me because I was just watching, and never a word was said. There they are around the table. They're together as a family, and they're just shoveling their food in as they're reading whatever's on Instagram or whatever news feed or whatever else is going on. This is a day of distraction. It's a day that we can become really dispirited. These are, these are difficult days. These are days to be self-focused about what I want and my rights. These are days that when things don't work out the way we want, that we just, I'm, I'm done. I am just done. And what Paul is saying right here is resolve to trust God. Follow him. J.I. Packer said these words, Your faith will not fail while God sustains it. You are not strong enough to fall away when God is resolved to hold you. God is resolved to hold you. Will you hold him? Will you hold him? Number three, a celebration of his glory. A celebration of his glory. Look with me in verse nine. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. So Paul's love for this church calls him to pray for the church. And here he tells us how he prays. He prays that their love may abound, that their love may multiply. You know, my friends, there's unity in love. There's unity in love. There's a a passage I read at every wedding I officiate. Colossians chapter 3, verse 14. And above all these things, put on love, love which binds them together in perfect unity. Perfect unity. Love brings unity. How does a church remain unified in this day? We pray and we love well. How does a church deal with all the distractions, all the competing interests telling us what we must do? You pray and you love well. What do you do when things just aren't going right, when, when, when things are just, you know, just out of sorts, when people are upset? How do you deal with that? You pray and you love well. You love well. When Caleb was up here a few moments ago to do our welcome, he had a t-shirt on, and I think he was embarrassed to be in the sanctuary with a t-shirt, so he had on a blazer. So I, 
I, you know, I probably, I wanted to tell him, just take the blazer off. We see it's a t-shirt, but it's a t-shirt that was worn yesterday. We had a great event out here on the lawn, and some of you may have been here with your kids or your grandkids, but we had water slides and water everywhere across these lawns as we celebrated the end of summer. I don't know if the kids were celebrating the end of summer as much as their parents were, but we were celebrating the beginning of a new year and launch and new uh, connect groups, Sunday school classes for kids. Had a great day. It was a lot of fun. And there were people and staff that had on these shirts, love God, love Dallas. That's what Caleb hid from you. Love God, love Dallas. And that's what Paul is saying right here, that first and foremost, we are called to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, our mind, our soul, and our strength. We love one another, and we love our neighbors ourselves. We love Dallas. We love our city. We love University Park. We love everything about where we are to the glory of God. Now, notice, love is an active choice. That's what he's saying right here. We choose to love. You know, I thought about this even yesterday. I was thinking about Paul as he's writing this letter. You know, he chose to love well. He could have chosen to remember those that made his life on that first journey really difficult. For this woman who seemed to frustrate his preaching, she was demon-possessed. Read the story this afternoon. There's a riot that ensues as a result. He's taken, he is beaten mercilessly. He and Silas both, they're thrown into the center of a hole of a jail. They're put in stocks and left to rot all across the night till God rescues them. He could have remembered that, but he doesn't. He remembers their partnership. He remembers their love. He remembers their generosity. And he prays that their love might continue to multiply, that it might abound. And if you go all the way to, chapter, or, uh, to the uh, 11th verse that we just read, he says it this way, it's to the glory of God. To the glory of God. That's how we celebrate. We celebrate to the glory of God, and it makes all the difference. Look with me at verse 9. He talks about how love uh, is to be guided. He says, by knowledge and prayer. True love is discerning. True love can spot that which is phony and wrong and evil. True love speaks the truth. I was talking with someone this past week that had a concern about something, and I said, you need to go talk to that individual. Speak the truth in love. He says in verse 10, love approves that which is excellent. Sounds a lot like 1 Corinthians 13. Love approves that which is excellent. And then verse 11, he talks about praying for the fruit of righteousness. Well, what is that? Well, it's the antithesis of the fruit of selfishness of self-righteousness. Self-righteousness is about me. The righteousness of God points people, points me to Jesus. It's the Spirit of God working in and through me, and there's discernible differences. There's a character that's produced. There's fruit. That's what he says to the church at Galatia. There's love. So he's been talking about your love may abound. It's going to happen as the Spirit of God works his way through them. He says that there's going to be joy and peace. Someone that is experiencing the the fruit of righteousness is a person that's patient. They're a person that's kind. There's goodness that reflects in faithfulness and self-control. That's what it looks like. It points to Christ. Romans 1.13, he says that a fruit of the Spirit is a fruit of winning souls. Well, what does that mean? It means that people are going to be attracted to someone who looks like what I just described. They're going to want to know why a church does this. Why is the church spending all the money that we're spending to go over and help Jack Lowe? Because we love, and we love well. When a church loves well, people notice. When the people in a church love well, people notice. Romans 6.22, he says that holiness is a fruit. That holiness is a fruit as we follow Jesus day by day, and we do it to the glory of God. So as we finish up today, I have a question. Has God finished his work in you? Has God done his work in you? And remember, Paul says it, it's God's work. It's God's work. It starts when we come to him in repentance, when we come to him in faith and we ask him to forgive us of our sins. It's the gospel. You want to know what the work is? It's the gospel work in you. And it's God's intention for each one of us that we're in relationship with him. 
I said this in the first hour. It is possible that people walk through their entire lives, they're faithful church members, and yet they never surrender their heart to the Lord Jesus Christ, and they spend eternity away from him. It's God's intention for us that we are with him. Grace and peace to you. If you've never come to that place, today's the day, August the 15th, 2021. Make it a great day.